abuse his power with, quote, some corrupt motive or other, he would be liable to impeachment. In the early 1800s, this understanding was echoed by Supreme Court Justice Story, who wrote his famous treatise on the Constitution. There he rejected the equation of crimes and impeachable offenses, which he stated must be examined upon very broad and comprehensive principles of public policy and duty. Later in American history, Chief Justice and former President William Howard Taft, as well as Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes, publicly stated that impeachable offenses are not limited to crimes, but instead capture a broader range of misconduct. Indeed, under, Chief, under Chief Justice Taft, the Supreme Court unanimously observed that abuse of the president's pardon power to frustrate the enforcement of court orders would suggest resort to impeachment. And this is square. Now notice, pardon power is unlimited. What they're saying here is abuse of the pardon power, use of the pardon power for corrupt motive was impeachable. And if all that authority is not enough to convince you, there is more. Historians have shown that American colonists before the revolution and American states after the revolution, but before 1787, all impeached officials for non-criminal conduct. Over the past two centuries, moreover, a strong majority of the impeachments voted by the House have included one or more allegations that did not charge a violation of criminal law. Indeed, the Senate has convicted and removed multiple judges on non-criminal grounds. Judge Archibald was removed in 1912 for non-criminal speculation in coal properties. Judge Ritter was removed in 1936 for the non-criminal offense of bringing his court into scandal and disrepute. During Judge Ritter's case, one of my predecessors as chairman of the House Judiciary Committee stated expressly, we do not assume the responsibility of proving that the respondent is guilty of a crime, as that term is known to criminal jurisprudence. What is true for judges is also true for presidents, at least on this point. The House Judiciary Committee approved three articles of impeachment against President Nixon. Each of them encompassed many acts that did not violate the federal law. One of the articles, obstruction of Congress, involved no allegations of any legal violation. And it is worth reflecting on why President Nixon was forced to resign. Most Americans are familiar with the story. The House Judiciary Committee approved articles of impeachment in July 1974. Those articles passed with bipartisan support, although most Republicans stood by President Nixon. Then the smoking tape came out. Within a week, almost everyone who supported the president a week before changed his position, and the president was forced to resign because of what was revealed on the smoking gun tape. Within a week, Senator Goldwater and others from the Senate went to the president and said, you won't have a single vote in the Senate. You must resign or you will be removed from office because of the evidence on the smoking gun tape. But what was on the smoking gun tape? The smoking gun tape were recordings of President Nixon instructing White House officials to pressure the CIA and the FBI to end the Watergate investigation. No law explicitly prohibited that conversation. It was not in that sense a crime. But President Nixon had abused his power. He had tried to use two government agencies, the FBI and the CIA, for his personal benefit. His impeachment and removal was certain, and he announced his resignation within days. Decades later, in President Clinton's case, the Judiciary Committee reported on the articles of impeachment stated, the actions of President Clinton do not have to rise to the level of violating the federal statute regarding obstruction of justice. They're talking about everybody but Trump, man. That's how you know they don't got none, y'all, man. This is crazy.